which, uh, which tells us what, uh, what uh, happens to the perturbations in the, uh, in the contour of the flame. And you see the, the sources of these perturbations are basically the velocity fluctuations which come into the flame and the uh, displacement fluctuations, again, which act on the flame. And you see that there is a slight difference here, but you, you can actually put these two terms uh, in a, an even better shape by just noting that SD0 is equal to V0 times N0. And as a consequence, this term here plus this term can be written as V1, SD1 divided by SD0, and you replace, uh, you, you put V0 dot N0 up uh, on the numerator. You see SD0 is actually equal to that, so, so you can do this. And then N0 itself is known, it's equal to minus gradient of G0. You see the flame is, is described, so you have a, a mean flame, and uh, the normal to the mean flame is N0, is minus gradient of G0. It's the gradient divided by its modulus, because it's a, it's a unit normal. So you take this expression and plug that in, in, uh, in the one there. And you see that uh, this term becomes V1 minus SD1 over SD0, V0 dot N0 gradient of, uh, modulus of the gradient of G0. So uh, burning velocity and velocity perturbations generate disturbances of the flame position in the normal direction, which are then convected along the flame front by the component of the mean local velocity V0t parallel to the mean flame front. So th this uh, really is a very nice physical representation of uh, the effect of these uh, perturbations. And in addition, can be used to, to look at uh, transfer functions. So, here is uh, uh, just this topic, the transfer function. Uh, the idea is to look at uh, combustion in a, in a black box way, somewhat in a black box. That is, you have perturbations coming into the combustor and they produce heat release fluctuations and we, we study that using the, this linear concept uh, we, we say that uh, the, the transfer function is given by the ratio. Now, the ratio could be just the heat release divided by the velocity, but this would not be dimensionless. And so it's not very nice because it would be given in, in weird quantities. It's better to say, uh, to, to use something like that, which is Q dot prime divided by Q dot bar, so this is dimensionless, and we divide that by u prime over u bar, or u prime over big U. Uh, so, so this is, um, th this is some Is it okay here? Right. Oh, I. <laughs> oh, there, there we, <laughs> here, here it wasn't. Is it okay here? Yeah. Okay. Good. So let's continue. So, so in control uh, theory, uh, you you use transfer functions. So th the idea is to to use all this knowledge. So you there is plenty of knowledge in in that field. And it's useful here because we treat things which are similar. What is different here is that the flame is highly nonlinear. It's not a, a linear system, it's a nonlinear system. But you will see uh, tomorrow we introduce what is called the describing function. That's a, a first way to actually study nonlinear systems using the linear concept of transfer functions. So, what we study here is essentially the small 
you, you see the, this growth of uh, pressure perturbations here using this concept of uh, transfer function. And uh, what, what sort of, what creates this uh, heat release rate fluctuations? One of them is just the area changes. The fact that if, assume that uh, the equivalence ratio is constant, so then the only, the only perturbation that produces this heat release heat release fluctuation is just the change in area. So you can actually describe that in terms of the area changes, and the area changes can be obtained from this G equation. I won't show how because it's a lot of calculations, but this is the principle. The principle is to use the G equation to obtain the, the fluctuation in surface area. You know the area of the conical flame and you have the fluctuation uh, by, by making use of this G equation. Uh, and, um, and here you, you have also this, uh, the pagoda flame at various frequencies. As you increase the frequency, the number of wavelengths that you see increases. And so this can be used and you get this expression here. Uh, another situation of interest is this, uh, is this uh, flame which is stabilized on the, on the rod. But this time, we, we use equivalence ratio perturbations here, and we send these perturbations into the flame, and it produces interactions at, at the top here, and uh, numerically this time, because experimentally, it's pretty difficult to, to make uh, such, uh, such perturbations in equivalence ratio. But numerically, you can do that. This, these are calculations carried out by Anne-Laure Birbeau. And uh, you, you see, you, you have this equivalence ratio here, which is sinusoidal, but the heat release here is not very, it's periodic, but not sinusoidal. And you see the, the you create harmonics because the flame is not quite uh, a linear system. So it's, uh, we, we will have to cope with that. You, you have this very strong nonlinearity taking place because you have pockets which are produced here and which then uh, send the pressure field and there is a, a, a very large peak in, uh, in heat release fluctuation here. And um, now if you look, you go back to the heat release, uh, the heat release itself is the product of the, the amount of fuel that you have in the flow times the density, times the displacement velocity in the normal direction, times the area, because you have to integrate over the area, and times the, f the fuel heating value, which is given in, in joules per kilogram. What is the heating value, for example, for methane? Who knows the, the number? 50? Not kilojoule. Per, per what? Per, per kilogram? No. 50 megajoules. 50 megajoules per kilogram. 55, it depends on the, yeah. And what, what about propane, what, what is it? 44. 44. And uh, oil, uh, what is the oil equivalent of, uh, it's 42 uh, megajoules per kilogram of oil. So th these numbers are very important. These numbers, uh, and, and what, is, what about hydrogen? What is the? What? 120. 120 megajoules per kilogram. These numbers are, are quite important to remember because you can immediately evaluate how much uh, heat release you will get from something. For example, one square meter of a stoichiometric methane air flame. How much does that produce? One square meter of flame, it's methane and air, stoichiometric, what is the heat release of that? So you don't know the answer. Of course, I know that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it, it's, it's important, you know. You have an area, uh, one meter, one square meter of flame, and how much does that produce? One, mega, uh, one megawatt. It's one megawatt. It's, so you need a lot of area to produce uh, a few megawatts. How do you do these areas? You, how do you do that? By turbulence. Turbulence makes much more area than if, you, if everything were laminar, 
you would need really a lot of uh, space, nothing would work. Unfortunately for us, turbulence is there. Yeah. So uh, by turbulence, you get this. So remember that uh, one, one square meter of uh, flame is about one megawatt. At, at uh, atmospheric pressure, I forgot to say. Of course, if you increase the pressure, uh, the density increases. The, 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 the displacement speed, the, the normal burning velocity diminishes slightly, but the density increases as a consequence you, you get, uh, so you require less area. So as you go to high pressure, things are more compact and you, you need less uh, area. Okay, so, so now when you take that expression, you see that the, uh, the heat release rate fluctuations will be caused by fluctuations in the uh, mass flow rate of fuel and fluctuations in the flame surface area. The, this is linear and as a consequence, these two add up. So, yeah, so that's this point here. And now, So we, we continue a little bit here, and uh, this is just to, uh, to put everything again in the, in the framework. Uh, I told you that there were many types of instabilities, and some of them are, uh, are not what we look, uh, examine here, like the thermodiffusive instabilities, which produce these beautiful cells, the Darius-Landau instability, they are important. Uh, a number of people are working, have worked on that theoretically, experimentally. Mark Stein, Clavin, Buckmaster and Lutford in their book, uh, Sivashinsky, Ed Law, Clanet, Sirby, and so on. A number of experiments have been done. And, uh, and in some cases, it's very important to look at them because you can diminish the sound radiation, for example, in oxyfuel welding torch this was done by Jeff Sirby, and, and uh, there is a patent uh, at Air Liquide uh, which brings the <coughs> noise level of their torch uh, down by more than 10 decibels. Uh, I told you also that you can find instabilities in various situations. For example, in this uh, uh, domestic boiler, you have instability at a low frequency and it involves the elasticity of the, of the system. The, uh, you see this, uh, the flame is, uh, uh, is fluctuating, but also the wall is moving while the flame is fluctuating. And uh, we, we also looked at this example. You remember this. Uh, this becomes unstable. So that's a, a practical flame coming out from a, multiple point injector and you see by changing the staging you can become unstable. So by changing a parameter you get instability here. Let me go to something that we will treat at the end of the of this uh, uh, course. It's the annular combustor. Uh, we go more and more into systems which look uh, like practical systems uh, except that uh, uh, in, in the lab, you want to visualize what goes on. So for example, here we have a, a system with multiple injectors. Each injector is a matrix. You see, you have multiple little flames and, uh, and these flames, uh, each injector produces about 90 little flames. And, uh, and the walls are made of quartz like that. You can look at the flames and in addition, we have orifices to take pressure inside the chamber and on the plenum. The plenum is here, the chamber is here, and, uh, and the system is annular and the diameter is 40 centimeters here. So it's already something which looks like a helicopter, um, a helicopter uh, combustor, a gas turbine combustor. 
And in, in this, this circumstance, what is interesting is to look at the modes which are transverse, modes which, which are uh, developing here uh, in the transverse direction. And uh, there are two types. One of them is spinning, so you will see this actually moves. You will see that the flames are moving around. And the other one is standing, and the standing mode is like that. So here we get to another complexity of... Uh, so let's see. You see, the, this is a spinning mode. And so the flames are, are stronger. And th this, uh, this is, of course, taken at high speed. Huh? So it, and, and so this is a coupling between a, an azimuthal mode and these multiple flames. So that's, uh, that's uh, stuff that we are uh, actually studying now. We, we are heavily engaged in this, uh, in this analysis of this uh, transverse coupling, because transverse coupling can be very destructive in gas turbines. In, uh, you, you find the same sort of mechanism also in rocket engines. Uh, I will tell you why these uh, modes are more destructive than the other ones. Uh, the standing mode can also uh, arise, and this is shown here. You see here, the, the thing is sloshing like that. It's like, uh, it's like uh, having uh, up and down. So first, the flames are here, uh, are stronger, and then here, and then here. You see, it, it is, uh, so the, one of the problems is when does this spinning mode uh, take place and what, when does the standing mode take place? That's a, that's a topic of current research and there is a lot of uh, debate. Some people say the spinning is uh, obtained because of the nonlinearity of the flame. Others say that the standing is, uh, is there when, when you break the symmetry and we found for certain operating conditions that you may have spinning or standing and, uh, and, and this doesn't seem to fit to, to the current theories. So this, this is a, a nice question at this point. So we, we want to study this loop and you've seen examples of this loop uh, just before. Uh, we've seen uh, that in cases where phi is constant, uh, we have just the area which produces uh, heat release fluctuations. Uh, the other mechanism that, yes? Yes. No, no, it's a. Yes, exactly, yeah. It's the. You, 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 for, uh, you have to explore the domain of operation. What is the domain? The mass flow rate and the equivalence ratio. And uh, everything else is fixed. And uh, in certain areas, you will find the standing mode. In other areas, you will find the spinning mode. And there is an area where you find either one, either the standing or the spinning, which is not, uh, not so... Uh, Generally, people uh, uh, have, uh, indicate that it's one or the other, but not both of them. But here it's both of them. And you can uh, have them for minutes. You know, it's there. And in, in the lab, you can run the experiment. There is no harm to the equipment. But of course, if you have that in a gas turbine, you cannot accept that. So, so this, this device is very nice because you, you can play. It's not very easy to get these instabilities. In fact, you you spend some time actually uh, getting to these unstable situations, but by that you learn what is wrong. And like that you can, uh, get, uh, that knowledge will help you then in design. If you, if for, at, at first our, our system was stable and, uh, and we, it, it took, uh, took us some time to make it unstable. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice game because like that you learn that by doing this or that, you, you, you become unstable. So this, this is a rule, of course, when you do the design, you have to do it the other way. Yeah. But here, we look for the instability. So, so one, uh, one point was that. 
the other one is you see this equivalence ratio in homogeneities. Uh, how, how are they produced? Let's suppose that you have fuel injected here and air coming in here. And if you have, this is a diagram which comes from uh, Leuven and Zinn in 1998, but there are such diagrams elsewhere, like for example, Oliver Pascherait and, and his group, and uh, it's, it's, it's the following phenomenon. You have a pressure perturbation. Uh, after a certain delay, this pressure perturbation gets to the, uh, to the uh, injector. Now the injector is submitted to positive pressure. As a consequence, it delivers somewhat less fuel, and so the equivalence ratio is reduced here, and this is a, a wave of equivalence ratio which is produced. Now this wave is going to be translated from this point down to the flame, and it will take a certain convective time and then there is a combustion taking place because it's not immediate and you converse, you convert the, uh, the, the fuel into products uh, after a certain time, which is generally short compared to this convective time. And you have heat release, which is here. And now if the heat release and the pressure are in phase, uh, you, get, uh, you have this possibility of instability. And this can be written down as a sum of this delay to get here, plus the convective delay here, plus the, uh, the combustion delay. And this has to be equal to an odd multiple of the period divided by two. So you have a, some sort of criterion for instability produced by this, this mechanism. And uh, I showed you already that uh, the uh, that equivalence ratio can can really uh, modify a flame. You see the the shape is modified, but in addition, you see that the velocity field is changed uh, in, uh, upstream of the flame. You see the the effect of equivalence ratio is to perturb the flame shape, but you also perturb the velocity field. So it's a little more complex than just saying you, you have uh, uh, perturbations of equivalence ratio and directly transforms into, uh, into um, burning velocity perturbations because there is a, a feedback, a flow feedback, and the velocity field is modified by, the, by this... Uh, by this mechanism. The, uh, it's, uh, it's, it can be seen in this, in this uh, uh, configuration. You see that the velocity is very strongly uh, 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 fluctuating. Well, uh, this is the plot on the right-hand side. You see that the velocity does not stay uniform there. It's, uh, it's modified. And what modifies that, it's the flame interacting with equivalence ratio perturbations. So you see the, the, the problem is a little more subtle than what, what is generally uh, considered here. It's, uh, it's a little more uh, difficult than, uh, than what is uh, considered. Uh, well, I've shown you this. We were very uh, These were calculations that we did for this uh, uh, V-flame. And, uh, and I told you that uh, these equivalence ratio perturbations uh, can produce these very strong peaks. We've seen that. So coming back now to this expression of the heat release, you see that uh, you have all these terms. So this is the area. This comes from the, uh, from the displacement velocity. And so you have the heat release fluctuations uh, come from these two effects. One is the area changes. The other one is the mass flow rate of fuel changes here. And, um, and you can decompose that in a number of uh, terms. And one term, which is just the fluctuation in the fuel, this is of order one here. Then you have the fluctuation in the burning velocity. This is the slope of the curve, and you know that the burning velocity has such a, uh, a shape, and it changes with phi, and 
this value here, A, is equal to 2.3, for example, for methane at this, uh, this point. So this, this is bigger than this. Of course, when you fluctuate the equivalence ratio, you fluctuate the, the level of uh, uh, the mass fraction of fuel. But this is one, but this is A. This is a little bigger. And, uh, and so, uh, in addition, you may, th there is also the velocity can change with the curvature, and this could be taken into account. So you have equivalence ratio fluctuations, which will act on this burning velocity here. And uh, of course, uh, systems like that have been studied. For example, these people, Romain Lauvergne and uh, Fokion and Golfopoulos were studying flames submitted to, to such uh, oscillations in equivalence ratio. So anyway, the, uh, the, the term which is here is 1 plus A, essentially. And so here you have phi 1 over phi 0. And so, uh, so basically, you can actually sum the two transfer functions, one for the equivalence ratio perturbations and the other one for the uh, area changes. And, um, and, uh, and again, we, uh, we, to, to, uh, to integrate all that, so here you see some of the literature on this uh, G equation and uh, its use in theoretical studies and, uh, and many others now in, the recent, uh, in some recent years, you, you find again, uh, calculations based on, for example, solving the full G equation and, uh, and finding the same results as, uh, as were found in uh, previously and some additional ones. Yeah. So uh, I, I told you how to perturb the G equation. This is just a repeat of uh, the reasoning. And uh, you see all that was done before. And again, the sources of uh, these perturbations are the velocity fluctuation and this, the, uh, the, uh, the changes in, uh, in, perturb in, in burning velocity, which can now be written more or less as A, you see this slope multiplied by phi 1 over phi 0. So basically, in a simple, uh, in a simple uh, let's say, analysis, in a simplified analysis, you can say that the burning velocity perturbations is just proportional to phi 1 over phi 0. And the proportionality factor is this uh, slope of the SL uh, versus phi uh, curve. So you know, this, you know this curve. You know that the, that the, the burning velocity uh, is like that. And you operate around phi zero here, and you you move you you fluctuate around this. So this is a fluctuation in phi zero, and here you have a fluctuation. Whoops, you have a fluctuation in in the velocity, in the burning velocity. But you see this this is this is nice. This is fine, and the slope is known. A is equal to 2.3, for example. At phi is equal to 0 0.8. Uh, but, uh, but it misses the fact that there is this feedback in terms of velocity. What, what I've shown numerically, you don't have that. You, you, you miss the fact that, uh, but, but al it's already something, but you, you miss some of the physics uh, because it, has a, it feeds back into the velocity field, so it, it changes. You, you get something in V1. So when you perturb phi 1, actually, you, you do something on v1. You don't, it's, uh, a, 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 the, the, the flame does that. So, um, so now, uh, a number of flames have been studied, uh, and you can go back in, in some of the papers around the years 2000 and a little more, and you will see that uh, we have uh, conical flames, we have M flames, V flames, like that. Multiple flames, we will look at those. And uh, 
tomorrow we will look at swelling flames. These this are uh, interesting because they are very close to practical, many practical applications. Uh, one, one way to actually do that uh, was done in, in this paper. It's called the unified model for the prediction of flame transfer functions. Uh, basically, it uses the G equation, uh, but in a frame of reference which, is, uh, which uh, goes along the flame itself. Uh, again, without doing all the calculations, you can show that the perturbation of the, the flame is given by that expression here. And you have one part which is due to the anchoring point dynamics. That can be important. Uh, the, the point where the flame is anchored can move, and so you, you have something which will, be, uh, uh, which will be convected along the flame. And the other part is due to the velocity contributions here. And uh, actually there are old experiments by Peterson and Emmons where, where they moved the, 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 the edge of the flame and looked at, the, at what happens on the flame, you see here. This is, a, this is a nice old experiment of these people. Emmons was a very famous uh, combustion scientist. Uh, uh, he did most of his later work on, on fire problems. Uh, Boyer and Kina have also looked at uh, effects uh, produced by, by moving the, the flame edge here. Kornilov in uh, Holland has uh, also moved this using an electric field at that point. And, uh, and I told you that by using the G equation, one of the difficulty is to actually, uh, actually impose the right uh, velocity field. And if you want to match experiments, the velocity field upstream of the flame has to be convective. Otherwise, you get something which doesn't look like what you see in the experiment. But if the field here is convective, then the flame is actually moving properly and you, you, you do get what you see in the experiment. And uh, another uh, situation where you have the same dynamics is multiple flames. You see you have a perforated plate here, a number of little flames, and these flames are displaced by the perturbation in velocity, uh, a spot is produced, and this, uh, of course, is a source of uh, acoustic waves, and then the flames come back, and you have uh, this mechanism. We've seen this film already. I don't know if it works here. No, it doesn't. But what is seen here is a... Um, uh, is, the, uh, is the particles used for this uh, PIV. So let's now uh, move again on, on this, uh, on this uh, flame transfer function concept. And um, so wh what we are looking for is combustion. Uh, we've looked at this, this part of, of this, and now what we look at is this part of the loop. You see the combustion acoustics, this was our topic at the beginning, and here we want to see how the flow acts on combustion. And, uh, and what we look at is the uh, perturbations in mixture compositions, perturbations in velocity fluctuations, and these produce perturbations in heat release fluctuations. And, uh, and so you see here, you have two transfer functions. Uh, they, they look alike in a sense because the sources, this phi1 over phi0 and v1 over v0, were acting very, very similar. How do you get these transfer functions? You could perhaps use DNS. In some cases, we can. For example, for the uh, equivalence ratio perturbations of flames, we've used DNS. The flame was calculated using DNS. You can use LES uh, for turbulent flames, but uh, this is expensive in terms of uh, computational time. It can run into many, many hours, and if you have to do that for a, a, a large number of frequencies, then uh, 
it requires uh, quite some uh, computational effort. Uh, I was uh, mentioning during the intermission that we've just done a, a calculation of one million hours. And uh, I, I was asking, how many hours do you have in a year? What is the, who knows the answer? Those who were with me don't, don't respond. How many hours do you have in a year? How much? About 9,000. The, the exact number is 8,760. Every hour counts, you see. When you have such a small number of hours, everything counts, unfortunately. So you have this uh, 8,760 hours per year. A million hours is one century. It's a little more than a century. So if you had a scalar computer, it would take forever, a lifetime, to get your answer. Fortunately, with 6,000 processors, you get the answer in a month. But you work very hard for that. But, uh, so now we, are, we, we, we can actually use very large computational times and uh, it requires resources, but we can solve problems of uh, greater complexity with that. So uh, one way is to, of course, accelerate this in some way if you can, uh, develop better algorithms, it's not easy, and, uh, and tr you, you can certainly use calculations to do uh, transfer functions. Experiments can be very useful because an experiment can give you an answer like that much quicker. But of course, you are limited, and so it's not always so easy, but uh, for the very nicely controlled flames, you can actually use experiments. Single injector experiments, where you, you look at, a, at one injector, you have the transfer function, and then you can use that for the multiple injector situations. Um, so the experimental uh, situation is as follows. You have uh, this burner, the loudspeaker, you see the flame using a uh, CH star emission. This gives you the heat release fluctuations here and then you, you measure the velocity using laser Doppler. This is a typical signal. Uh, so what you see here is the photomultiplier, and what you see here is the velocity signal using laser Doppler. And so like that, you can, this is at 10 hertz, this is at 30 hertz, so like that you, you see how the, the signals, they are not quite sinusoidal, but not far from that. Uh, and then you, 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 you get this transfer function uh, using cross-spectral analysis. Uh, this is the best way. You take the, uh, the, the signal out and you, you take the signal in, calculate the cross-power spectral density here. You calculate the power spectral density of the signal x of t and you get the, the transfer function by dividing one by the other. That's, that gives you a phase, it gives you the gain, and you have the, the answer in a, in a, nice, uh, in a ni nice fashion. And of course, to do that, uh, I was telling one, one of you, spectral analysis consists in doing averaging over a number of blocks. It's not just a single Fourier transform. A single Fourier transform is not valuable for the signals which we use here with all signals. Mathematicians spend a lot of time explaining that you have to be L-square integrable. But in fact, our signals are not L-square integrable. They, are, they have a finite power, but they have an infinite energy. And as a consequence, you cannot use a single Fourier transform. You use what Wiener has uh, developed. It's the, the Wiener theory, which tells you that you have to average to get a good spectrum. So the power spectral density is obtained by averaging over a number of blocks. And so you calculate Fourier transforms, put uh, that, uh, take the modulus of a square of the Fourier transform, and then you average over a number of blocks. So this is also called the, the method of periodograms. It, it allows you to improve the signal-to-noise ratio when you do that. And statistical convergence is required, a large number of periods to do a, a good uh, 
a good uh, determination of this uh, transfer function. So th these are typical transfer functions for conical flames. And as I told you, the initial, the initial phase that was calculated by considering that the velocity was uniform upstream of the flame gave, a, uh, gave this sort of behavior. It's like a low pass filter, but the flame is not a low pass filter. You have uh, the, uh, the phase actually uh, changes here. And uh, if you plot that, this is plotted in logarithmic uh, coordinates, but if you plot it in linear coordinates, it shows that essentially you have a, a delay. You have a delay here. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, you, you can show that it's very close to a delay. And this can be obtained by assuming that the velocity field upstream of the flame is, is convective. In the, the unified framework that we, we developed with Thierry Schuller and Daniel Durox, uh, this is very well uh, demonstrated. So le let's go back to, to some of these flames. I, I've shown this. Uh, this case is interesting because the main interaction takes place between vortices which are shed from the lips of the burner and the flame. And you see the flame is rolled up in this uh, vortices. And, uh, and the signals that are produced are very large changes in flame area due to this roll-up by the vortices. And, uh, and you see also that the, the changes in surface area, which are here, are very well reflected in the, in the pressure signal. So you see this, the pressure signal is right here. It's a, it's a thin, solid line, while the, the other signal here, the thick solid line here, are very close. Uh, the, this is another view of the process, and this is a film, so we can see that uh, dynamically. So you see the vortices uh, rolling up the flame sheets, and the flame sheets interacting, and this is taking place uh, continuously. So you have this mechanism of vortex flame interactions and the flame is rolled up in the vortex and then uh, sheets of the flame are uh, eliminated by interaction and uh, so what you see here are the particles used for PIV and uh, these are droplets, uh, oil droplets and uh, they burn across the flame so this delineates the flame so the flame is inside but also the boundary of the flow so you see here, on the outside, the boundary of the flow. On the inside, it's the flame. Uh, here is another uh, case. Uh, this is at a higher frequency, and you see uh, the same mechanism. Now you have multiple vortices, which are in the flow between the lip and the, uh, and the flame. So uh, you see they roll up the flame at that point. This is a, a free flame, it's not uh, uh, confined. But if you put confinement, in fact, this mechanism of uh, vortex roll-up takes place very close to the wall and there is an interaction with the wall as well. So, and you see that the, uh, the pockets of, uh, of a fresh mixture which are being burnt and of course produce uh, surface area reduction and uh, and emission of, uh, of sound. And, uh, and this is also seen in this, uh, in this case here. So now what, what do we do with these uh, transfer functions? Well, uh, we, we measure the transfer functions. We have, for example, situations for this V flame where the transfer function gain is above one, it can... And what you see here also that it depends on the level of excitation. You see the gain here is a function of the, of the level. As you increase the level of excitation, the gain is diminished here in this band. So, so there is a band where the flame is very sensitive to perturbations. If you are at a higher frequency, you see, the flame will not respond very much. So, uh, so the flame, in terms of gain, acts as a, as a low-pass filter. So you see that 
you cannot just say n is uh, the interaction uh, index is a constant because the gain here is like that and then it's very, very small. Uh, you don't expect to have an oscillation taking place here because the gain will be really small. While here you have a large gain and that may be susceptible to instability. And then you have the phase and the phase is, a, is an important uh, point of this. Some people uh, uh, are just showing the gain, but not the phase. But the phase is essential in such a situation. I, I had a paper uh, recently where, where just the gain was shown and without the phase. So it, it's, it, it's not useful in, in such studies. You, you need to have the gain and the phase. And here the phase is, uh, is, uh, is linear with respect to to the frequency and as a consequence you have a, uh, uh, a time lag. So this indicates that you have a time lag. You can calculate the time lag by just looking at the phase and dividing by the frequency. You have to be careful that this is omega, so to get the time lag you get it. And in this case the time lag doesn't change much with the amplitude. So you increase the input and in fact the time lag is about the same. This is one case, but in other cases, it's different. All right, so this is for, for that part. And now let's move to uh, some applications. And um, so perhaps you, uh, some questions first. Let's, uh, yes. Yes, the question is about the heat release fluctuations and the fact that the perturbations in the burning velocity produce heat release fluctuations. Yes, exactly. The, one of the main mechanism is this one, is you, you change the equivalence ratio by this mechanism of, uh, you know, the, the injector, uh, instead of giving you a constant mass flow rate of fuel, does not because it responds to the pressure it sees. So, of course, if you have a very strong, if your injector is very stiff and whatever you put as a pressure, it delivers the same value, then you're safe. It doesn't produce that. But usually injectors are not like that. They, they are sensitive to the pressure uh, at their uh, exit. As a consequence, it delivers a fluctuation in, mass uh, uh, in the flow of fuel, which produces a fluctuation in equivalence ratio, which produces a fluctuation in the burning velocity. Now, when the, when the burning velocity changes, the flame shape changes, and this change in the flame shape is fed back into the flow and produces velocity fluctuations. And that's what, I, uh, what we've seen from calculations. This is not measured. This is just calculated. And, uh, and so in addition to your equivalence ratio fluctuations uh, reflected into this burning velocity fluctuation, you have this other mechanism which is important. Yeah. Yes. Or oh, the flame stretch. Yes, what about the flame stretch? Now the flame stretch um, can modify a little bit the, the burning velocity. Yes, the flame stretch is curvature and strain rate. And, uh, and the two modify, but not to a large extent. It's, uh, it, it's also a, a factor, uh, but it's not, not in the case of premixed flames. In the case of non-premixed flames, the, the strain rate modifies, the, the changes in the strain rate have a very big effect on the reaction rates. What is the effect? How does that go? 
the heat rate, you, suppose you have a flame, you see this is a, the typical flame where you can study that is a, is a flame formed in a, in a counterflow. So you have, let's say, fuel here, oxidizer coming here, and you, you have a flame sitting, for example, here. So as you fluctuate, you see the, the strain rate is imposed. There is a certain amount of strain. The flow here is like u is equal to epsilon s x, v is equal to minus epsilon s y. This is the typical flow field close to a stagnation point. You have a stagnation point here. And so you see that the flame, which is sitting here, is submitted to, to a certain amount of strain. This is very useful because uh, a flame, a non-premixed flame, which is not submitted to strain, consumes really nothing. So, for example, a candle, a candle uh, has, is, uh, consumes very little. It takes a lot of time to see the, 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 um, the candle finally uh, vanish because it consumes very little. To have, uh, to have consumption, you need to strain the flame. You need to blow on the flame and then it consumes more. And the rate of consumption is proportional to, to the strain rate? No, to a certain power of the strain rate. Yeah. Which one? It's the square root of the strain rate. The, uh, in, in such a flame, the mass that is being consumed is proportional to the square root of the strain rate. Actually, if you want to, to be less, um, yeah, well. And uh, if you plot, you know, the, if you look at the, at the consumption in such a flame and you put the strain rate here, the curve is a parabola. It goes like square root epsilon s to the one half. And so to get consumption in, uh, in such flames, you need to have strain rate. If you have very low strain rates, you have nothing. At a given point, you, you reach the extinction st strain rate, and this is what happens, and you have the flame suddenly drops down. Why? Because you strain very hard, so the mechanical time, which is associated with the inverse of the strain rate, becomes shorter than the chemical time. As a consequence, extinction occurs. So when some flames are very difficult, actually, to extinguish. For example, you take oxygen, hydrogen, pure oxygen, pure hydrogen, put them together, you need uh, strain rates which are like 100,000 seconds minus one, very large. But for hydrocarbons, it's not as large. It's, uh, so anyway, up to this point, it's essentially epsilon to the one half. So, so for non-premixed cases, uh, the strain rate is, is, very, is very important. Is, uh, yeah. of the pressures and so on. Does, does turbulence help damp effects of, uh, of the pressure? Uh, what is the effect of turbulence in all that? Now, turbulence, uh, turbulence does change the, the burning velocities. So instead of having the laminar ones, you have turbulent ones. So you have uh, the SD is different. Uh, is there a damping due to turbulent fluctuations? It's not clear. It's not, not so clear. Um, uh, numerically, it does. Uh, unfortunately, when you try to do, uh, uh, when you put your models for turbulence, usually they are, uh, it's a viscosity and so, you damp, 
by, by just... So this is why LES is useful, because uh, it's hopeless to do uh, a dynamical calculation using RANS. RANS will... Uh, the, the viscosity, the turbulent viscosity will, is so high that you damp your acoustic waves, and, uh, and so... Uh, and this is artificial. Uh, does it correspond to the reality? Not so. Now, it's this, in LES, it's, about, it's also a little problem because you put in a certain viscosity. It's much smaller. It's, uh, it's scaling like the size of the grid. So as you decrease the grid, you, you get less and less of this artificial viscosity. Uh, so that's one little problem with the calculations. Um, now, the turbulence in itself it does a lot of things to acoustic waves. Uh, uh, in, in, in the early studies that we did, for example, we, we, were, we were investigating, uh, we, we were in a, in a wind tunnel like that, and we placed a, a sound source in, inside a, a body, which was nicely, nicely uh, streamlined. And the, the source was here. And we sent uh, acoustic waves uh, through this uh, loudspeaker, a driver unit, and we had microphones sitting outside the shear layer. So in the shear layer, you have these vortices, or the other way around. It may not be the right, right way like that. And, uh, and so the waves were, were coming out from this... Uh, from this, uh, where, and uh, what you see uh, in terms of waves is that instead of having a sinusoid, you have something which, uh, which, um, which is amplitude modulated very strongly. Actually, the uh, the modulations are, are really powerful. It's like when you speak and there is a lot of wind, you know, so the the noise uh, goes up and down. So the signal becomes uh, something which is uh, highly modulated in, in amplitude. It's difficult to represent. It's something like that. And when you do spectral analysis of this signal, you have the carrier frequency, which is here, but you have two sidebands, which uh, arise here. So it's scattering. So, so what, what turbulence does, it, it scatters some of the... Some of the some of the, the signal, which is um, initially at the frequency and, and produces this uh, sideband. So you have a spectrum which, which looks like that. This is the power spectral density. And, uh, and what are the frequencies here? Well, basically, it's the frequency of the large-scale structures that you see here. So it's even a, a way to actually determine the spectrum of turbulence. You get something which looks somewhat like the spectrum of turbulence here. You see, it's, it's brought around the, free, the carrier frequency. Let's say here you have one kilohertz. And so you have energy, which power, which, which is here. And this spectrum here looks somewhat like the, the spectrum of turbulence. And the, the main frequency here is basically the frequency of the large-scale structures. So as you increase, for example, the velocity, this increases. This is typically a frequency which is like the convec convection velocity divided by the, 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 the wavelengths of these structures right here. So you have something which, which is like that. So as you increase the, the velocity, this increases. OK, so let's stop for uh, a quarter of an hour. So come back at uh, 11.20, and we, we do some applications of these various concepts.